This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. It's almost always better to have your vocal mics with the rejection point facing the drummer because they're already going to be, in, in, even in a room as big as this one, even an SM58, anything is going to become a room mic for the drums, you know, especially if you're compressing the vocal a little bit. So you want to try to reject as much of that as possible. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with a unique golden drop capsule design. The Vintage Series V67 and V11 microphones offer Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a rich, warm sound to your studio with crisp clarity and detail that will make you wish that you had discovered these mics a whole lot sooner. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKS star right now to get 50% off their vintage series microphones. Hey, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Matt McQueen, a studio owner, recording engineer, music producer, and videographer who's built his studio in 2013 in an abandoned church located in the mountains of a rural East Tennessee town. The building has a 30 foot by 50 foot live room with 24 foot high ceilings and large old wooden rafters. And Matt has recently gone full time with his studio, having had plenty of experience creating music, but also creating content as a videographer for other producers like Warren Hewitt and Glenn Fricker. This has led him to creating his own video channel for his studio to help promote local artists and bands. And we live in a world where social media and YouTube channels can be an important part of our musical output. So I'm psyched today to talk with Matt about making the leap to go full time in music with his studio, but also see what we can learn about making content for our own studios and artists that we work with. And of course, we're going to be digging into Matt's process for recording and mixing records as well. Please welcome Matt McQueen to Recording Studio Rockstars. Matt, are you ready to rock, dude? I am ready to rock. Glad to have you here, man. Glad to have you here. Well, glad to be here. This is exciting. So um, tell us where in Tennessee you are. I know you're, I'm, I'm in Nashville. You're somewhere towards Knoxville or something, right? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm basically three and a half hours outside of Nashville um, and an hour due north of Knoxville in a little town that is right on the border of Kentucky called Jellico. Wow. That sounds like something out of a Johnny Cash song. Like a, a, like a sure place out of a Johnny Cash lyric. Yeah, it, it for sure could be. <laughs> um, right, well, so, so uh, <clears throat> let, me ha let me have a couple of takeaways from this. I'm going to assume that Jellico is not considered like a music city or hub. So, you know, perhaps you're starting in a studio in a place where, you know, there's there's not a ton of bands around or, or, or are there a ton of bands there? No, there's, I, there are a few, uh, local fellas that kind of play guitar and, and, uh, you know, they, they write songs, but they're, I mean, it's really like maybe one or two other people in town that are, that are doing, that are doing music. Um, Jellico is exactly what you would picture in your mind. If somebody said small little Appalachian town, 
two traffic lights and a McDonald's. You know, that's that's exactly that's exactly what it is. So there's no no music scene here at all. Wow. Well, so um, <clears throat> tell what's the name of your studio? It's Gem City, right? Yeah, Gem City Studios, and it's a great the re- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it is fun. The re- I wanted something that was going to be endearing to the town, and so you know, I was trying to. I was going through um, when I was originally starting the studio, just trying to think of something um, that wasn't uh, that, that that wasn't corny sounding, uh, but also had a little bit of meaning to it. And right when you get off of the exit, you get so I seventy five North coming out of Knoxville. Uh, Jellico is the last exit in Tennessee before you get to Kentucky. And when you get off the exit ramp, there's a couple of gas stations, and one of them has a Wendy's inside of it. And in that parking lot, out in front of the Wendy's, there's a sign that says, Welcome to Jellico, the gem city of the mountains. Nice. And I just thought that was really great, you know? I figured maybe it was like, uh, you know, in Tennessee, there's all these cave areas, you know, caves all over the place. I thought maybe there was some relation also to like caves and you know, maybe your studio's down inside a cave with just gems hanging from the city, from the ceiling. Yeah. Um, well, so, but it sounds like the the space that you found is, it sounds like an old church. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. It's an, it's an old church. Um, basically, so in t- 2012, 2013, I was, um, I was a full-time IT guy at, uh, there is a small hospital here in town, and I was... Um, there's only, t- uh, there was our boss that was the director of IT. And then there was just two of us that were on the floor fixing the computers. And we both just happened to be, um, musicians, guitar players, songwriters. And we had like a little home studio rig in my house, me, my, me and my best friend, Brett. And, um, we were all the time talking about what if we could, you know, have this like studio business and ah, it doesn't make sense to have it here, but if we could find a cool place, it might be cool to do it kind of a thing. And, at the same time, I'm driving down this road to the hospital every day for work, and over my left shoulder, I see this little tiny church kind of nestled in with some houses right next to the the city high school. I kept thinking to myself, I bet that would be a great place. You know, if there, if nobody's using that, that would be a, such a cool place to have a studio because of that huge ceiling. I bet it looks amazing inside. And so I just started asking around town. Because we weren't really, it was really just a hobby still at that point for me doing, you know, doing recordings. I did a lot of stuff for my church. We had bought a Pro Tools rig just to to get into uh, recording the sermons. But I was always recording extra stuff like the band playing or something like that and taking it home to mix. Or Brett and I were going to my house and, you know, we would find there's a local college in Kentucky about 15 minutes away. And so we were always trying to find you know, if there was like a band on campus, we, we would try to, you know, see what they were up to. And we eventually ended up recording one of them for free just so that we could have something to do, you know, try to, to play around with seeing what it was like to record other people's music. Yeah. All this is going on at the same time that I'm passing by this building and working this full-time job fixing computers. And so we just asked around town and finally somebody, somebody told us who to contact. Uh, they, they knew the person, and so we contacted them, met with them, told them that we wanted to open up a studio in this in this building. And they in the, the initial meeting, they told us, well, the church is empty and we're definitely trying to find somebody to use it. Uh, but it's between you and a do- uh, somebody that wants to open up a dog grooming business. And I remember driving away thinking to myself, now, who in the world would want to open up a dog grooming business in Jellico? And then as soon as that thought entered, entered my mind, I thought, well, who in the world wants to open up a recording studio in Jellico? You know, what's a, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> so that's the kind of town that I live in is, you know, like that was, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of just a funny, you know, ironic thought process, but we ended up getting the building. Um, and then Brett, uh, as soon as we got the lease ended up moving away to Chicago and kind of just, you know, left me with, well, this is yours to figure out, you know, kind of a thing, which, uh, was actually awesome because I, I feel like, after six years, I'm starting to figure it out. So nice, man. So, um, you know, did you grow up in Jellico or did you just sort of end up there as a um, place where you moved with your family or something? So I grew up in, in Mount Vernon, Ohio, which is, uh, outside of Columbus. It's, um, it's in the, basically the dead, ce- dead center of, of Ohio. Uh, that's actually, you and I have a mutual friend, Rob Chandler. That's close to where Rob Chandler. Oh lives. yeah. Rob rocks. Hi Rob. Yeah. You rock. <laughs> yeah, he's he, he's probably going to listen to this. I'm almost certain that he's a he's a 
he's a rock star. So, um, so yeah, so that's where I grew up. My wife and I met in Southeastern Kentucky at this, uh, the, the private college that's like 15 minutes up the road. It's called, um, back then it was called Cumberland college. Now it's university of the Cumberlands. Uh, that's where we both graduated from. And that's how we found out about Jellico. And we met people that lived here while we were in college. And then she graduated, got her master's degree as a physician assistant and now she's uh she's working at a she's worked at a clinic here in town for 10 years and that's how we or 12 years now that's how we ended up here right so okay so just trying to like paint the picture you start out outside of a place like columbus ohio which is certainly a music hotbed you know that's like there's cool cool indie music and bands coming out of there for for decades and then you end up in a place that um relative to that feels very off the off the beaten path you know um and yet you still decide to open a studio which is awesome i love hearing this story and i want to dig in more into how that's how that's going and what kind of stuff you've learned about um making something like that work uh briefly give us a little bit of an introduction to how you just got started in music and like what sort of a musical background did you have an experience in recording and all that yeah so I was probably 15 years old and started going, uh, my dad is a harmonica player and started going to these bluegrass jam sessions with him and would just kind of hang out, listen to the guys play music and thought that it was super cool. And the guitar player in the band, uh, Danny, um, was like, he was like younger than most of the other guys that my dad was playing with. Um, he was still, you know, way older than me, like probably 10 or 15 years older than me. Uh, but he was, um, he was friendly and he was picking the guitar and he would always like, like show me little things that he was doing. And so because of that relationship, I was like, I got to learn to play the guitar. And so I, I started taking lessons from Danny when I was 15 years old. And, um, after just a couple of, you know, four or five lessons, I just started, you know, every chance I could get to get on the internet, you know, this is the, this is the early nineties. So every chance that mm -hmm. I could get to, to get on the internet and go to like, you know, the guitar sites back then and try to find tabs for, uh, whatever, you know, Pearl Jam or Nirvana song that was big at the time. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was doing that. We didn't have the internet at my house either. So I had to go to my neighbors and like use their internet for like two hours. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was how like, I was learning you the guitar. You sound like me growing up. I didn't have, uh, I didn't have, um, VHF. I had UHF. So we had a black and white TV, but it was only like the first eight channels, but we didn't have the higher channels where all the cartoons were. Yeah, that's exactly what I had. <laughs> so I had to go to my friend's house. <laughs> Yeah, I had to go to my friend's house, or I had to. I can remember. Um, so I grew up in a pretty, uh, pretty conservative home, and so I wasn't allowed to listen to a lot of the stuff that was on the on the radio. Um, my mom pretty much uh, had me listening to only Christian music, and so I can remember pretty distinctly going to my grandparents' house, and they had like you know whatever the normal cable package was, and and discovering MTV, you know, as a junior in high school, mm -hmm. and and seeing. You know, the stuff that was, that was when MTV still had, had videos, you know, and seeing stuff like, um, I can remember loving the video that the prodigy had, uh, for, um, uh, I think it's breathe or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, that, that was such a cool time for me just because, you know, it was a little bit rebellious and I was getting into rock music and like, you know, I was also, uh, friends at school were giving me like, I can remember getting the ink, the, the first big incubus record and just being like, my mind was blown at how the guitars, and the drums and just everything sounded on that record. Um, so that was, I think that was for sure like a part of my musical journey is kind of this late discovery of all this stuff that was like massively popular in the late nineties, early two thousands. Well, so um, as we kick off the podcast, I'd like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote. Is there anything you want to um, share with us with the rock stars that get us psyched about hitting the studio? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think this is um, this quote is, is kind of, uh, akin to kind of my journey just with the studio and just things of, that I've figured out along the way in recording. But here in East Tennessee, uh, and I'm sure in Nashville too, we're huge Dolly Parton fans. You know, mm -hmm. we're not far from, we're not, we're, you know, less than a, basically an hour from Sevierville. And, and, uh, this Dolly quote is, um, one of my favorite from her and it's, we can't adjust the wind, but we can adjust the sails. Ah, uh, nice man. I like that. <laughs> That's yeah. That's great. I haven't gotten any Dolly Parton quotes on the on the podcast yet. No, that's a great one. Oh, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so rock stars. Uh, so Sevierville is where Dollywood is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of between. It's like in the countryside outside of Sevierville and Pigeon Forge, kind of between them. 
I've, ne- I've never been there, but I, I'm always like intrigued by the fact that it exists over there. And yeah, it's like Hillbilly Six Flags it's for anybody that's not that's <laughs> that doesn't know what Dollywood is. It's like Hillbilly Six Flags. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, cool, man. Well, uh, let's see. Um, you know, you've you started your studio. I wonder if there was any stories you wanted to share about. Um, you know, like now you have a studio that's quite beautiful in this beautiful location, but um, to begin with, you know, you had to create this thing. Uh, were, were there any stories about sort of failures, important failures for you about trying to launch this studio that turned into good le- learning experiences? Yeah, I mean, r- straight out the gate, I think the first important failure that I had was coming from this, you know, pretty inexperienced home studio background, you know, right around this time that I was starting the studio. Uh, I think the only thing that was like really out on the internet was the recording revolution. Right. And, uh, Joe Gilder's thing, home studio corner, something like that, which I was eating that up. You know, I was, I was subscribed to basically everything those two guys were doing and just eating it up every chance I had to listen to a podcast or watch a video or, you know, and then it eventually turned into, they put out some courses that I ended up learning stuff from that. Cause I, you know, I didn't go to school for this. I went, I went to school for psychology and then never did anything with it and became an IT guy for five years and then started doing uh, recording just because, you know, I was a musician and into computers and it's kind of a natural progression. And so, you know, I'm trying to learn all of this stuff, but going from like a home studio environment where you're trying to just learn your, learn how to record your own stuff to the first time that you have a client in and in a really big space, there's, there's a, a lot of information that gets probably left out. Uh, not, not intentionally, but just because it's kind of, kind of two different worlds. So I remember getting the space and getting moved in and I had a band contact me, you know, back in these days I was either doing some stuff for free or just whatever I could get paid for it because I was just trying to get experience. And so the first ever band that I moved into the place and I brought my computer over and set up my, my interface, which I think was one of the older, like, uh, Motu 896s, mm-hmm. um, and had everything like patched in and my microphone's ready. And it was probably like five or six days to the band getting ready to come. And I had ordered a bunch of uh, Roxul from Lowe's. And so they said it was ready to come and get. And I went down there to get it. And I was going to make all my acoustic treatment over the next like three or four days. And I get there and it's the the stuff that they got in. I didn't order the right stuff or or somebody didn't order the right stuff. I don't know if it was me or the person at Lowe's, but uh, it wasn't like the dense hard rock soul, like the R80 or whatever that you want. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was like pretty soft stuff that was like basically a little bit slightly more dense than, you know, like the pink roll up, you know, foam right. that you put in your ceiling or whatever. Right. And so I was like, well, I can't, you know, I didn't buy it and I left and the band was still coming and I was like, I don't know what to do. I probably need some acoustic treatment. And so I had seen some videos somewhere about guys using, moving blankets. And, uh, I had my mom go and pick up moving blankets from a U-Haul, but she got the ones that aren't like the heavy padded oh, the moving blankets. Ones. She got the real thin, like, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and I didn't know what, I, I really didn't know what to do with them because nobody was telling me this stuff. And I really couldn't, at the time I didn't really look to find it. I just kind of like watched a couple of YouTube videos and said, I'll just figure it out. And so I ended up just draping them over mic stands and kind of just putting them around the room and kind of hoping for the best. And, uh, you know, we did the record and the band was super happy about it or whatever. We did like five songs, uh, over, over the weekend. Um, and they were just, they they were trying to be real lo-fi indie rock. So, you know, nobody got hurt, you know, nothing terrible happened, but I've gone back a few times. We have this tendency, I think as engineers to like torture ourselves and go back and listen to our old work. Right. Totally. totally. (laughs) And, uh, so, you know, I've gone back and done that a few times and listened to it and been like, Oh my gosh, what was I doing? I should just put that off another week or two until I got some treatment in this place or something, you know? Well, I mean, your solution was a pretty good one. It's one that I use a lot here. Actually. I'll do, um, I call it the T mic stand where you set it up uh, you you make the mic stand go as high as it'll go, and then you just have the t- the boom arm go across the top as a T, and then you can just drape a blanket over it. Um, and if you have the right kind of pack- packing blankets or thick ones, where I-, I remember buying a bunch of mine on eBay, you know, and they were like twenty bucks a piece or something many mm-hmm. many years ago, and those are really effective. Those will really really treat you know tighten up the sound of the space. But of course, you're dealing with a church, so you may have had quite a lot of ambient reverb in there too. Oh yeah, it was all. So at this time, the the church actually had drop ceiling in at nine and a half feet, 
Uh, and so, and then it's a 30 by 50 foot room with, um, so, so after the church went out of business, it was a daycare for just a couple of years and they had this activity car- carpet on the floor. That's kind of like, it's basically like a rubber pad with very, very thin carpet on it so that you can bounce balls and the kids can run in their shoes and not slip and, you know, fall as much or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so that was, so it was a really, really weird sounding room at the time. And then everything else was just bare, bare drywall. So it was super echoey. There was tons of, uh, once I started learning about acoustic treatment and trying to make the building better, you know, there was, I was starting to notice things like tons of these weird flutter echoes and things like that. And, um, yeah. Yeah, So that's kind of the cool thing about studios. If you're pacing yourself, you can discover all these different sounds about the space that you're moving into. And um, especially if it's the first time. I mean, I remember I had to learn all this stuff and discover it all for the first time. You know, first time you hear a flutter echo, flutter echo and you're like, you clap your hands and then you hear this like boing between two walls and you're like, oh, wow, that's the sound bouncing back and forth really fast between those two walls. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And there was it was interesting too because I remember there were spots where like, you know, in one location you could hear it bouncing back side to side. And then if you'd step into another area of the room, you could hear it bouncing back and forth between the floor and the drop ceiling. And mm-hmm. it was, it's really, it's like, it's almost like there's, uh, in, in this room anyways, the best way I can describe it is it's almost like there was uh, an invisible rubber ball just going back and forth. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, all right. So now let's, let's talk about your intention with the studio. So first off, let me back up one step and ask you this question, which I think you kind of answered because you're talking about the bands that get you excited in the nineties, the music that really turns you on. Like if you could, pick any genre or style of band and record it next, how would you describe it? Man, I would, uh, I would do nineties rock forever. (laughs) If I could do anything that I wanted to, I think, um, which is actually, but I ended up somehow getting right now. I've got a ton of like, uh, singer songwriter country clients that don't have bands, which is Mm -hmm. such a weird, hard thing to have outside of Nashville. Um, but, uh, but it's cool because a lot of the people that, are in Kentucky are really into Chris Stapleton, um, or, uh, Sturgill Simpson or Jason Isbell or like, um, uh, who's the guy I was listening to today, Luke Combs. And so there's Mm -hmm. like this, there's like this thing happening in country music where we're kind of getting away from the, you know, the eight Oh eights with the snaps as our rhythm. And we're going back to like real drums and, and big sounding rock guitars. And it's almost like, uh, nineties rock with, with, fiddles and pedal steel is right, kind of what it's right. starting to sound like. So, um, so I think that for me, it kind of goes hand in hand and like, you know, I, I listened to a ton of some of my favorite records are still like all the stuff that Brendan O'Brien was doing in, in the nineties, you know, nice. those, those first couple Pearl Jam records just sound incredible to me. And that's like, that's like the, you know, especially the drum sounds like when I'm trying to set up room mics in my room, I'm thinking of, uh, the way that the room mics sound on, Pearl Jam's versus record that the, they just sound incredible. Yeah. We just had Dave Hillis on the podcast when we were talking about, um, uh, recording Pearl Jam up in, um, 10, he was talking yeah. about how they got those drum sounds up there and it's pretty awesome. Well, um, that's cool to hear. And I mean, yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of nineties rock too. I like, <laughs> I, I describe it as like, uh, I like stuff that sounds like it's probably, it probably had its, um, moment on college radio and it's probably got guitars on it and they're probably distorted. Yeah. You know, um, we'll take it. All right. So, but then again, you talk about like, you know, these songwriters, singer songwriters coming in and stuff. And I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, thinking about it, you've got people out there who are writing and 
strumming a guitar of their own music and they may not have a band yet, but they may be very motivated to want to complete these songs and get them recorded and get them out there um, and need help doing that. So what, what kind of stuff do you find yourself in a position of trying to put together the music to back up these songwriters? Or is it just people who want to come in and just play guitar and sing by themselves and want to get a great capture of that? Yeah. So, um, I, I do a couple of different things when I have somebody that comes in like that. Like, so there's, uh, I, I have one or two clients that can play guitar well and sing really well. So there's this one guy that's a singer songwriter from uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, and, uh, when Clayton comes in, he wants to do, you know, and play, you know, the guitar solos and like, you know, any, any riff ideas that he comes up with. And then usually what I'll do is end up hiring a drummer and a bass player for him. Um, or if, if I can't do that, then I'll at least do anything that I can. That's, you know, guitar or, um, I don't think I have on any of Clayton's tracks, but there's a few people that I've played guitar for over the years. So I'll, I'll do that. I, cause I started playing guitar, like we were talking about a minute ago when I was in, when I was in high school and, you know, played in bands all through college. And then, um, you know, up until starting a studio, I was playing with a band kind of regularly. So mm-hmm. I, so I like playing guitar and stuff like that. But then, other, you know, I've actually had, uh, at least I think one of your podcast guests, uh, on several of the projects that I've done just this past summer. And it was really cool because, uh, I listened to his episode right while he was working on tracks for two of my artists. And that's Smith Curry. who's a phenomenal pedal steel player. Yeah. He's great. Isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And Um, super easy to work with. So I'll do stuff like that too. If I can't get somebody around here that, uh, can do like, you know, the basic stuff that I need that I want to do in house, like drums and guitars. Um, I'll, I'll hire somebody out like Smith or I recently hired, uh, Ross Holmes, who's a fiddle player in, uh, in Nashville. I think he plays, he plays with Warren Haynes and I'm, and fairly certain he also plays with nitty gritty dirt band and he's a phenomenal fiddle player too. Nice man. Well, um, talk a little bit about, um, the, you know, the, the number of bands that play rock as a full band around where you are versus, uh, you know, these individuals who are trying to like, you know, get their, get their music recorded. Do you feel like it's, it's kind of a balance or do you feel like it's the band thing is, is more rare and how do you go about finding the bands that you'd love to be recording? So I think for me, it's been, it seems like it's been mostly bands until this last, this last year. Uh, and I don't know what the reason is for that, but it was, you know, I think maybe I was searching more for bands. Um, but then just studio business seems to come through word of mouth for me more than, than anything else. And it's always been kind of this slow burn for me anyways, cause I stayed in my full-time job for the first three and a half years that I was working on the studio. And then right around the time that I started working for Warren Hewitt, I transitioned to working just part-time in IT at a different hospital so that I could be in the studio more more full-time. And so for me, it seems like the bands have always come kind of word of mouth. And, and because I've always had a job, I never had to worry about if I had a slow, a slow month or two. So probably since I've gone full-time and started trying to market myself more, I think that that's where I started to pick up more, more clients that needed a, a full band. And, mm-hmm. um, so one of the things that I've, I've done to market myself and to try to find bands is, uh, doing live streaming stuff on, on Facebook, because it's a good way to show, to show the studio. It's a good way we have, um, I have a, I have a partner here and, and he and I together have a pretty large collection of gear. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's tons of amps and we've got a cool console. We've got a couple of drum sets and probably, you know, 75 guitar pedals. And so there's lots of always something cool or interesting, I think, to show off. And, and people get a kick out of watching that, especially if you've got somebody that's a really awesome guitar player, or a really awesome drummer, you know, getting to watch the recording process can be fun and enjoyable to some to some folks. But I think also sure. solves a problem for some people. You know, they're seeing that like, oh, I don't have to have a band to go into the studio. I've got my song and there are people that are willing to finish it for me and do it really excellently. Uh, and so that's, you know, and part, part of the live streaming thing also just came from things that I learned about video and, and, and stuff when I was working for Warren, um, the, 
the big experience that I got that kind of gave me this, oh, I should live stream stuff in my studio was at the time I was doing everything live stream with my phone. You know, anytime that somebody came into the studio, I was just pulling out my phone and going live on Facebook. Very simple, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that it doesn't really give people a good idea of what the music actually sounds like. They can hear, you know, most of it, but not in detail, right? So around the same time, I'm working for Warren Hewitt, editing video for Produce Like a Pro, Warren's premium courses, things like that. And uh, Warren had an idea to do a masterclass at Sunset Sound and offer it to some of his Academy members. And so uh, we took 12 Academy members to Sunset Sound to Studio 3, uh, which is an, an amazing room. And the idea was, is we want also to have another subset of people that couldn't make it to the master class or maybe they couldn't buy that because we only sold 12 tickets. It was limited seating. Mm -hmm. and and But we wanted to offer it to people that wanted to watch it online for the three days. And so we were like, well, how do we do that? And so that was my task was to figure out how to pull that off and make it so that people could have like a multi-camera view of the studio, hear the audio that's going on, hear Warren as he's teaching stuff, or, you know, he brought in different, uh, you know, LA guys that have made awesome records, um, like Ulrich Wild and Shelly Yakis and, and Cameron Webb, tons, tons of cool people that have made a, a bunch of cool records. And, you know, we want everybody to be able to see every second of this if they pay for an online seat and watch it. And so through research, I basically cobbled together uh, this little rig using my, my laptop and using free software that anybody can get called uh, OBS. Mm -hmm. And um, bought a, I did buy a couple of pieces of equipment, but I already had cameras. Um, but I, I bought a couple of pieces of, of equipment that would let me uh, use my, my cameras with my, my laptop and, uh, capture the audio from like a mixing board, like a little 12 channel Mackie and a separate audio interface. And, uh, we put together this live streaming rig and, you know, for 10, 12 hours a day for the three days that we were at sunset sound, we streamed this whole process of putting together, putting together a song from start to finish. And so then wow. as soon as, as soon as I got back from sunset sound, the immediate thought that I had was I was like, I have to build a rig like this for the studio because it would be so much cooler uh, for me to show people what I'm doing in my studio, you know, little glimpses, 15, 20 minute videos of tracking the guitar part or doing drums for a song uh, in the same kind of way um, and give them the actual audio, you know. So a lot of times it's even like, you know, in the in the, the post or the comment about it or whatever, put your headphones on so you can hear the actual audio, stuff like that. And um, it's been super fun for for me to put that together, sometimes it's a little stressful when, you know, those pieces of equipment don't work and it's not right. always easy, but yeah. it's, it's awesome for, uh, for the band too, because what ends up happening is, is that they have this really natural thing where they're like interacting with, with their audience and they're sharing it on their pages, which is basically free publicity for my studio and for the thing that I'm doing. And so I've ended up picking up, um, you know, a hand through through this past year have ended up picking up a handful of clients, you know, a half dozen or more throughout the course of the year that are people that, you know, oh, I saw your live stream is what they'll say. Or I was watching such and such's video when he was at your studio and you guys were doing this thing. And I'm, you know, it's so it's it's like this to me, it's like this essential part of of what my studio business has become and making it work in this small rural town where there are no bands and everybody that comes to me has to come from a larger city or someplace that's, you know, an hour, two, three, six hours away. Wow. Yeah. Well, so you definitely want to, um, create some intrigue for them so that they think this looks like a really fun, cool place to come to. Uh, what are some of the geeky tech details, um, and challenges of doing this kind of multi-camera, live streaming thing. You talked about, um, you said, you know, use a Mac keyboard. How does a Mac keyboard come into play? Um, if you're in a studio, is it, might you be capturing something that is typically mic'd up and going to the Pro Tools rig, um, like a normal recording session? And, and how does, how do you integrate a, um, a Mackie mixer to capture some of that other stuff? Yeah. So the, the biggest challenge with this is that you want people to hear the Pro Tools audio, which is, you know, that's that's easy. You're just, you know, if you've got an audio interface that has more than two outputs, you can dedicate a stereo pair to be basically your your live stream mix coming out of Pro Tools. Um, so that part's easy. But the challenge is, is that 
if all they're hearing is music, they're missing all of the conversations of like, you know, what's happening and what am I doing with the drums and am I EQing anything or am I, you know, I want people, if I'm making suggestions to the band for like things that they could change, I want people to hear those ideas so that they know that it's not just me pushing, you know, uh, pushing three on the number pad, you know, mm-hmm. hit and record and, and that it's actually, you know, that there is some production that, that they're, that they're coming to me, not just for this live stream thing, but they're coming for, uh, for, to have the record produced and be the best version of themselves. So you want those conversations to happen, uh, and be a part of it, but you're in a room where if you leave a microphone open all the time so that it can pick up those, those control room conversations, you're also going to get all the spill from the big studio monitors that, you know, are probably turned up loud um, because mm-hmm. bands can't stand to listen to anything quiet. Uh, so you have to figure out a way to be able to do that. And um, I have a, I have actually a better system for that now that doesn't involve uh, the Mackie board, but the Mackie board was like my first instance of being able to do that. So because I could basically put the, um, I could put the Pro Tools feed in a couple of channels and I could put a talkback mic for the drummer or anybody that's in the live room into a channel and I could put a talkback mic uh, for myself into a channel. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as different things were happening and I'm switching, you know, switching camera angles or whatever, I could bring different faders up and down so that people could hear those conversations. But then when music's going on, just quickly mute them so that all they're hearing is the Pro Tools feed and just having it coming out the the stereo mix of the Mackie and going into the computer that's capturing the audio. So it's really, it's, it, it feels like live mixing. You're live mixing an event. Um, and, and that sounds, to me, that sounds a little bit like a full-time, uh, you know, uh, focus during this. Are you, do you find that you're able to get into a groove where you can both produce the session and be in Pro Tools, but also kind of have, some sort of mixer thing to the side where you can manage switching mics and cameras and all that kind of stuff? Or does it get really complicated? Sometimes it gets really hectic. And that's been one of the things that's made it to where I, I've, I've started to learn that I don't want to do this on every session. It's It makes a lot more sense to do it with... I have a couple of people that when they come in and they do you know session work for me, um, one drummer in particular, Dylan... Uh, when, whenever Dylan is here, he's a phenomenal drummer and usually comes with a ton of great ideas. And so I always want to live stream if I have him in the studio because I don't have to, I feel like I don't have to manage as much. You know, there's sometimes you have have a have a musician that needs a little bit more like help just getting their mix right and their uh, you know getting their self set up right and they want to communicate with you more, but. I try to focus on when I'm going to do this live stream stuff, focusing on the guys that I already know um, are are going to be really, really good at, at, at what they're doing. And I've I've made a couple of mistakes where I've had like different people in the studio, and I I went ahead and did a live stream with them because I was like, oh, I've never had this instrument in in the studio. I should live stream it, you know. And then right. you unfortunately find out that even though their band is really cool and they sound pretty good when they're doing a live show, that doing a live stream where you're listening to whatever instrument it is that they're playing really hot and out front and it's the focus of your your live video is not a great not a great decision. And uh, you know, just just because it's it doesn't sound good, it's not very flattering to the to the artist. And so I think a best practice that I've kind of learned is to really to have the stuff kind of at the ready where if I want to go and do a live stream, I can quickly turn it on, Mm -hmm. but to not, to let them get a couple of takes under their belt first and get comfortable with just the process of, of recording and, uh, being in the studio and, you know, having people stare at them through the control room window, all the things that come with, with recording, you know, where you're kind of under a microscope, um, before you go and you, you know, go live on Facebook. Yeah, well, I think it's a great tip because um, you know, it's a great reminder that now as engineers, producers, where traditionally we might have been just focused on making music, you know, we live in this world of social media and video and live streams and stuff, and and the demands on you as an engineer kind of have increased in a lot of ways where it's like, oh, you got to, um, you know, you might you might need to get a great recording of something, but you might also need to be thinking about how you share this with the world right now, you know, (laughs) not all records are released when they're finished. It seems like a lot of records now might be need to be released constantly 
while they're being created. So it's a good mm-hmm. reminder to, you know, strike a good balance with that. Yeah, that's, I think there's, there's, man, there's so much in that because I can remember one time that I, I had a band from Toledo, Ohio, Track and Drums, and uh, this was before I even had my live stream rig, um, and I was just doing live off of my off of my cell phone or whatever, and we did like two whole drum passes of a song, and, uh, you know, the band wasn't mad at me, but the singer kind of, you know, pulled me aside after the session and said, hey, would you mind to just take that video down? She's, you know, she was like, I know that, uh, you know, you're trying to, to push your thing out there and, you know, it's, it's, you know, people are watching it and so they're going to be into our music and we're super grateful for that. And she was, she was very gracious, but she said, just take it down because, you know, we don't want anybody to hear our songs before we actually release the record. Um, and I, you know, I think it was super frustrating to me because I felt like it was kind of uncalled for. Like you should definitely want your stuff to be heard on video. But at the same time, I think it's also a good cautionary tale for anybody that's thinking about doing this for their own studio. Because I mean, as much as it might be, as you might think that it's good for you and good for the artist. So it's a no brainer. You also just really have to be sensitive to what's the artist's opinion of having their stuff out there for the world to see in this really raw, unfinished, unpolished, you know, kind of a, uh, format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I've seen both sides of that, that coin, you know, making records and working with people. Um, so that's, that's a good tip, man. Thanks for pointing that out. Well, let's take a break for just a second and we'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstar is a reminder that we'll have links to stuff we're talking about here with Matt in the show notes. Just click through on your mobile device, um, including a YouTube playlist that I put together. That's got um, some of the the videos and live streams that's Matt that Matt is doing from Gem City Studios, and we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock. OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Vintage Series V67 and V11 with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring a classic, expensive vintage sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTAR to get 50% off their Vintage Series microphone. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the V67. Wouldn't it feel great to have one of these in your studio? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Matt McQueen, joining us from Gem City Studio in Jellico, Tennessee. And we're going to dig more into creating cool content for your studio and recording great records. So, Matt, you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam. All right, dude. So I've got a few more geek questions to ask you about this video content that you're creating because I love this stuff. I got I got kind of hooked on it years ago when I started doing similar things to try and promote my own studio. I have a, had a um, YouTube series called Stereo Sessions, and it was 
essentially similar things to what everybody else is doing where a band performs live in the studio um, and I would mix it live through the console. Um, and but But like you run into all these brand new challenges of, well, how do you do this? How do you capture things? How do you edit video? How do you, we, we actually never figured out how to um, do the live switching. So I was always editing video after the fact, which is also really fun, but can be time consuming. Um, but let me dig into some of the geeky questions about getting this live stream, live switching thing to work. Your camera's shots all look great. You're obviously using high quality cameras and it looks like um, I noticed that you have a lot of handheld cameras. I think that, that that might be accurate. And that was one of the things I discovered, that a handheld shot looks far more interesting than one that's sitting static on a tripod. Um, but do you have to keep the cameras like hardwired into your rig? Or is this something that people can hope to do set using Wi-Fi and things like that? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of ways to do it. A couple of the... Um a couple of those videos that I sent you YouTube links for uh, are are exactly what you're talking about, where it's like a live performance, and we just capture the live performance, and then I edit it, edited it in 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 Final Cut. But with talking about the live streaming, I have uh, pieced together a like a multi camera rig so that I can because I a lot of times I'm showing people stuff in Pro Tools at the as, at the same time that I'm showing stuff in. The, whatever's going on in the live room plus mm-hmm. having like a tracking room shot. And so I wanted to have kind of three different, three different angles to be able to show that while we're, while we're recording something, or if I'm mixing something, I'll have like a, like a shot where it's like me talking to the camera and it's like a more wide shot in the control room. But then if I'm showing something in pro tools, I want to switch to that and be able to show the pro tool screen plus have my face still kind of overlaid on top of pro tools to be able to teach people or or talk about whatever we're doing in the in the production or the mix. And so for that I use OBS and which is that it's open broadcast software I think is what it stands for mm-hmm. and it's it's free. Uh it takes some it takes some getting used to, but there's a really awesome community around it, which yeah. is ho- how I've learned how to use it is, you know, they they have um I think Discord is what it's called, where it's basically like there are people just on this this Discord server 24-7. And if you just type your question in, there's some guru out there, you know, that's also online that already knows how to do this. And he's just sitting there just kind of like, you know, he's probably playing video games or something, sees your question rolls in, roll in, and he's like, oh, I know the answer to that. And just you get instant feedback almost. Wow. So you can learn a ton about OBS that way. But um, so... I have Panasonic uh, Panasonic G series cameras. I have a couple of G sevens and a GH four, which are like 4K cameras that I um, downscale in the OBS software to 1080p. So th- that's one of the things that helps. I think them being 4K helps them to look a little bit a little bit sharper, and they do mm-hmm. pretty good with like lower lower level studio light. Uh, back in the day I had Canon cameras, which were kind of popular for people doing like indie films and stuff like that. Um, but I switched to these G sevens, uh, because to me the image just looked, looked sharper and I wasn't really going for this like cinematic thing with like a shallow depth of field. And so how I get them into, uh, OBS is, uh, black magic, uh, makes this little box. Um, actually let me, uh, it's sitting here on the shelf and I can't remember the name of it. It's uh, the Ultra Studio Mini Recorder. And basically what this is is a little box that comes. It's got an HDMI input on it, and it's got a Thunderbolt output. So I'm using a MacBook for OBS, and I'm just simply connecting my camera, my mirrorless Panasonic camera, using the HDMI output on the camera to come into this little box and then going Thunderbolt into my computer and i think you can get those boxes for like 150 bucks and um then you just you end up having the full the full picture of the camera coming into the studio or coming into the obs right, coming studio into the computer yeah, yeah so the, in, and the yeah. the macbook is a separate computer from the one that is running pro tools or it's the same one that's running pro tools it's it's separate so i have the um I have the tracking computer is coming. Uh, that's where all the audio is coming through. And then I'm actually using, we have several of the, I'm sure you're familiar with these, the hearback mm-hmm. uh, monitoring things. So for anybody that doesn't know what a hearback is, they, I'm sure probably everybody does, but there might be somebody. It's basically 
um, a brain that you can feed eight channels of audio in, and then it has Ethernet cables coming out of it that goes to these little remotes. And so then you can use these little remotes to mix your eight channels of audio um, into headphones. Um, but what's cool about the Hearbacks is they also have uh, a separate left and right line output on them. And so what I'll do is I get, um, I have my live stream mix and I have a talkback set up in Pro Tools that has the Soundradix mute omatic plugin on it. Oh, that's which a great basic, plugin. <laughs> yeah, which, which is awesome because it mutes, uh, it mutes the, uh, the talkback mic when Pro Tools is recording or playing back. And so what that lets me do is I, I send that talkback mic to the hearback and I send the Pro Tools audio to hearback. And then I can also put a, I can have a talkback mic for the drummer or whoever's doing something in the live room set up. Uh, which is usually just like some condenser in Omni, and then I run it through a compressor or something like that. And all that gets mixed on the hearback, and I'll I'll have a set of headphones attached to the hearback so I can hear that mix. And then it comes out of those line level outputs on the other side of the hearback and goes into just a uh, $100 USB interface. Right, so that's pretty clever. I mean, I know one of the challenges, um, and, I, you know, I don't... I, I love getting deep into this stuff, but maybe the rock stars are going to be like, maybe they just need an intro to it. Um, <laughs> but the challenges that you didn't expect to run into when you do this, this is what's really important to share with everybody. Um, the audio mix of these other microphones versus what's coming out of your computer, that's where you run into challenges. Like, you you know, you watch the stream later or something, and you're like, oh, man, I wish somebody told me that this one mic was way too loud. <laughs> You know, yeah. so that's cool that you figured out a clever way to use sort of a mixer and make sure you're getting all these things right before it hits OBS as opposed to um, uh, OBS does have built in audio mixing capabilities in it and you can input all kinds of things, which is really cool, but you don't really know what it sounds like unless you're listening on another computer somewhere afterwards. So that's pretty hip, man. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty cool, and it keeps me. I think earlier you were asking me just about like whole, the whole like managing the audio plus the video for the stream and switching cameras while you're trying to produce a record. And so, one of the things that just naturally happens when you do this time after time after time is trying to figure out ways to like. I don't want to have to mess with that. I don't want to have to click a button in Pro Tools. I don't want to have to, you know, I don't want to have to mute some microphone because inevitably you're gu one time you're going to forget and then either nobody's going to hear your stream audio or they're not going to hear your talkback mic or something dumb like that is going to happen. And mm -hmm. so I've done know, it, been there, done yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. So you try to figure out ways to make this as enjoyable for your audience while, you know, minimizing the amount of workload that you're putting on yourself. Well, now another challenge that I've run into is um, this mic that I'm talking to you on right now is a USB mic. And that one is a great one for me to use to feed into OBS to do the talking. But meanwhile, Pro Tools is, you know, spitting out the audio a different way. And those can get kind of not out of sync, but they can have a latency between the two mics. And if I accidentally leave this one on, then all of a sudden you have this slapback echo between the spill of the speakers into this mic. And those are some of the challenges that are that are tough to deal with. And uh, maybe with your way of pre-mixing the audio, it can kind of help that. But another question, um, before I digress too far, um, you talked about, you mentioned three different cameras. How important is it for the rock stars to have the exact same camera for a multi-camera thing? Or can they get away with like, you know, one of these, one of these, and one of these and still make it cool? Yeah, uh, you can you can have uh, multiple different cameras. So like a lot of times um, when I'm doing a live stream, one of the cameras, like the control room shot, is almost always just a, a USB webcam that gets uh, blended in with the camera that's in the live stream or the live room that is usually the Panasonic camera. Um, and then and and sometimes I've even to have m more angles. I've also done uh, the built-in macbook webcam you know and so that gives me three camera angles then plus i i'm pulling in the uh the pro tools the pro tools screen from the tracking computer which obs does this really cool thing too uh this is kind of a kind of a side note but um i have no idea what it stands for but they have this feature called uh an ndi source and ndi capture and so on the pro tools computer i have obs installed on that too 
And since both computers are on the same network, you can set the Pro Tools screen as an NDI source. And then on the capturing computer that's the broadcast, the laptop, um, I pick that source uh, um, on it, that same, that same NDI source is a, a NDI capture. Mm-hmm. And so then, so then you can make your Pro Tools screen another um, another camera angle, basically, without having any uh, wires or anything connected. Um, so, and there's a there's a tiny bit of latency in it. So, like sometimes you'll, I'll notice that like the meters on the Pro Tools screen aren't exactly lined up with the audio that's coming from from the Pro Tools feed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it's it's like a super super small amount and so i've been playing around with like in obs you can adjust the audio uh the sync of the audio with the source like forward or backward in milliseconds and so i've been toying around with that trying to get that lined up a little better so that it doesn't drive somebody crazy that they're sitting there like seeing a snare drum hit and the meter you know is (laughs) coming up just slightly behind it you know yeah i've run into that stuff too now do the rock stars have to have like the latest and greatest computer to be able to use any of this stuff? Is it only for Mac, only for PC? No, you, it's, it's, um, it's for PC. And also, if you don't have uh, Thunderbolt, uh, you don't have to use the little black magic box that I'm using. Um, this company called Elgato uh, makes some USB 3.0 uh, capture devices that work really well. And I actually uh, I went to Texas a couple of uh, about a month ago uh, to install a Pro Tools and live streaming rig in a church that was wanting to broadcast their their services to Facebook and YouTube, and the computer that they bought was a or that they had was like a a Dell PC or something like that, and it had no PCI slots for a capture card. It just had USB 3.0, and so we just went to Best Buy, and I think it was like 120 bucks. Bought this little just it's basically like a USB d- dongle that you can plug um, an HDMI source into. And so you can you can go that route or if you're, if you're on PC. OBS is still free for PC, and there probably are more versions for, for PC just because it's a, it's an open software, and so people can tweak it. Um, and there's just more people doing that sort of thing on a PC than there are, than there are a MacBook. But my, my Mac is also old, too. My MacBook is, um, I think it's a 2012 or 2013. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's pretty, it's getting pretty long in the tooth, but it still runs OBS pretty well. So that's cool. That's encouraging. And then, um, uh, oh, I was going to point out Rockstars that this software and that stuff, if you do decide to dabble in that and you're trying to make these video channels for your studio, um, don't be too discouraged, but all this stuff exists, not because of us. It all <laughs> exists because of live streaming gamers. That's why we have access to all these great free tools is because, um, there are people out there that are just streaming their video games all day long. I sh- I'm saying people out there. I'm probably talking to you who's listening to this podcast right now. Some of you are doing that. But um, yeah, cool, man. Well, let's see. Uh, what else do I want to ask you about? Uh, do, 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 do we covered the wire cams, the conversation mics. Those are just like the USB webcam here or the one that's in the laptop or whatever. Is it? Do you have to get fancy with the conversation mics to hear everybody talking? Uh, I've been trying different different things. Actually, I, I'm I'm I feel like I'm not ever satisfied with what I'm using for a conversation mic. Um, I've tried like small diaphragm condensers that have like an you know an omnidirectional capsule on them and putting them somewhere kind of central in the room. I've tried that. I have a um, the talkback mic that's for our actual tracking Pro Tools rig is just like an old AKG like D1000, which is just like a it's like I don't even know what year it's from. It's probably like the late eighties or mid nineties or something like that. It's a dynamic mic. That's kind of like an SM 57. And it's Mm -hmm. just like, you know how there's like the hole on the back of your monitor stand or whatever that people run cables through or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, We just, we have the microphone literally just shoved through that hole and just kind of the cables are just like loosely holding it in. And so for a lot of the live stream stuff I've done, I'm just using that same talkback mic and then patching it into the hear back going to my, to my live stream. So, um, well, it's a good reminder, too, that it's not the high fineness of it so much as it's like you're going to get most of your mileage out of having a mic in the right location mixed loud enough for people to hear what's going on. And if you really lean on compressors, you know, whether it's in the computer or whether you actually have a spare compressor laying around, um, you know, that'll that'll level out the sound of all these things and, and make it so that 
whenever you turn on the room mic for conversations, you're just hearing everything everybody's saying and it's and it's easy to know what's going on with the video. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's exactly what I'm doing is I'm I'm using that um that Massey limiter. I put that on my talkback mic before the the mute omatic plugin mm-hmm. so that I'm getting extra gain out of the out of the talkback mic, but then also if there's somebody sitting on, you know, like the guitar player sitting on the, on the couch and you know, you want whoever's watching on Facebook to be able to hear him talk about it. Uh, you know, that mic's not even really pointed at him, but because there's so much compression on it from that limiter, um, you know, you can, anybody that's watching on Facebook can hear whatever suggestion he throws out while we're tracking drums, for example. So, so now, uh, it just occurred to me though, if you have this, um, high high gain compressed conversation mic in the control room. Is that one feeding into the? No, that's feeding into the MacBook um, computer that is it doing is. the OBS streaming, or is it actually going through the Pro Tools session on, a, on some kind of secret channel? Yeah, it's going through the Pro. It's actually it's so it's my same talkback channel that's going to the drummers' uh, headphones. Um, and so what I'm doing is, uh, that's why I have a hear back in the control room also. So, because I've already routed everything through my hear backs for monitoring for the artists that are out in the live room playing, it was easy for me to just grab an extra hear back and pull it into the control room and then, uh, mix my own mix for the live stream right on that. And then once it's mixed, I don't have to touch it again. It just, it just works. So when I'm, when Pro Tools is going, all everybody's hearing is just the Pro Tools mix coming through the hearback that I have set up. And when I stop playback and I'm talking to the band or they're talking, those talkback mics are also mixed into the to the hearback. But they're getting automatically muted from that 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 Mutomatic plugin. Any warnings for not accidentally blowing up your studio monitors if you've got a super hot mic in the control room? <laughs> yeah. Before you turn it on, definitely uh uh, make sure that the routing is correct because I've done that before. That is not fun. But what I what I usually do is that I have a uh, I don't know how this works in other DAWs because I've only ever worked in Pro Tools. But um, Pro Tools has the import session data function, and so I just I always go when I'm bringing in my stuff for a live stream. I always go to a session that I know that the live stream was set up and working correctly, and I just import the tracks that I need using that import session data. And then that way I know that it's already just patched correctly and it's going to work right. Right. So you're not taking that super hot conversation, Mike, and routing it to the stereo mix output of Pro Tools. It's going on like a separate routing that just sends it over to the hearback system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a reminder for us to be careful of uh, all these open mics um, and not having the speakers cranked up. Oh, yeah. That's a bad day when you do that, too, especially if somebody's got headphones on and, you know. You're going to, yeah. you might get the, you know, the cussing of your life if you said that to a drummer that's got in ears in or something, you know, buried into his ear canals. And then all of a sudden there's like this feedback because you've set something up wrong. That's a bad day. Yeah. I've seen the uh, NS10 woofers turn into confetti here in the control room and just <laughs> shower us in the mixed position with, with oh, paper man, confetti. I've, gotcha. Yeah. I've not seen that, but that's also a bad day. It's one of those things you only need to see once. <laughs> Then you start double checking that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then you, then you, then I pulled out my drill. I drilled holes in the back of my NS10s and I put in surface mount fuse holders and I installed fuses on each <laughs> driver so that they would never blow again. Oh, that's just, a great idea. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. Some people would say that, that now your audio is going through this teeny tiny fuse wire on its way to the speaker. But uh, I'd rather have um, I w- I would rather have speakers that are working all the time. They they just there's so many ch- opportunities for them to blow up um, when other people are using them as well. And and um, you know I think if you have self powered monitors that have protection circuits in it, that's one of the big benefits of going that route because mm. um, you might have a speaker that's going to protect itself from blowing up. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about recording. So uh, describe how you set up a band for one of these. Uh, well, I guess you got different things. You got the live stream for what's happening during the making of a record, but then you also have like the live performing band in the studio. Let's talk about that for a minute. Cause I think for a lot of people, that's a reasonable thing to try doing the first time around. If you want to create a YouTube channel for your studio um, and you want yeah. to have invite a band to come perform and, you know, do something cool. Yeah, that was always my, the way I always looked at that too was like a, 
like a low cost point of entry. I, I used to use that. Um, a lot of the videos that are on my YouTube channel are things that I did either like super cheap or just for free because it was, you know, I always wanted to find bands that I thought were already really good and that there might be some mistakes. There might be some warts, but like, that's, what's cool about a live performance. You know, if they're actually a good band, like most people are willing to overlook like a note being just barely out of tune or, you know, somebody going to the chorus just a little bit early or something like that. And so I always try to find bands that like, if I would go to bars or coffee houses and see somebody do something that was cool, I'd try to like, just like, Hey, you should just come down to the studio and we should do like a video together. Um, I, I, I bought cameras the day that I got the keys to the studio because I, I was for sure. I thought, if a studio is going to work in this remote location in this old church in a town where there's literally no music scene for 30 to 40 miles in any direction, you know, I'm going to have to have cameras and show people what is going on here and, um, let them connect with other people and let people find out about this place, the way that, um, you know, from their living room, you know, with their cell phones, because everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on YouTube, you know, things like that. And so I knew that that was having cameras was going to be like, a critical, critical part of the thing. And so I always invited bands to come down and, and for me, it was just this, it was this huge experiment because I started this right from the beginning, essentially of trying to figure out ha how to do a live recording. And I don't remember ever finding much about it. I just, because I listened to, to, you know, podcasts like recording studio rock stars and would hear people talking about like, this is the way records have always been made in Nashville, you know, kind of thing of right. having a band playing together in the room, you know? And to me, it just always felt like this, like, Oh, they don't record stuff separately. Like they don't do the drums and the guitars and everything, you know, like the, which is how my band recorded when we were in college. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it, to me, it seemed like this rite of passage or something like that. And so from the very beginning, I was like trying to figure out like, how do you do this thing where you get everybody to play together and they can hear everything really well, but then they can also see each other and there's line of sight. And then, but the microphones sound good together, you know, all those kind of things. And so, um, I don't know that I have this like fantastic method for doing that, but some of the things that have helped me along the way are like, you know, I, I don't remember at what point that I discovered it, but I used, I, I, and I, I do this occasionally if it's like a more performance kind of a thing, that's the way that the band wants, wants it to look like, uh, like they're on a stage or something like that. But it's almost always better to have your vocal mics with the rejection point facing the drummer because they're already going to be in, in, even in a room as big as this one, any, even an SM58, anything is going to become a room mic for the drums, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you're compressing the vocal a little bit. So you want to try to reject as much of that a as possible. But I, some of those live videos that are up on, on my YouTube channel, you know, I remember like pulling my hair out trying to edit those because the drums were behind the vocal mics. And every time the singer would like step out of the way of the microphone to like jam on his guitar or something like that, all of a sudden you're hearing the cymbals, you know, 10 dB louder than they yeah. were before he was standing in front of them. So I think, you know, for the most part, it's like just taking your time a little bit more uh, to set things up and, you know, to listen to what you're getting coming through the speakers before you ever start rolling the cameras, you know, and just paying attention to that. And I, I feel like that's like the most obvious advice, but I've been, you know, bit in the ass so many times because I, you know, didn't do that because I, I wanted to hurry up and get to turning the cameras on and get into the action to the exciting part of of the thing, you know, getting to mm -hmm. see the band do their thing in front of the camera. You wanted to rock out. Yeah, exactly. Um, I found that whenever I'm going to have a vocal mic in the room with the drums, uh, it, it often goes well if I start with the vocal sound and then I start adding, adding everything else around that. I mean, it kind of depends on the sort of session too, especially if I'm going to do something with a condenser mic, then you know, you, I have to start with that vocal sound and then, you know, as I add other things, find out if they work and, uh, and adjust accordingly. But, um, when the band's playing, what about, what about the guitar amps? Do you find any good tricks for isolating or is isolation not what you, th what you thought it was, you know, is it better for things to kind of bleed into each other? Yeah. So I, I do want, I, I want a little bit of bleed. Um, but you, you know, you'd be surprised. Like, I, I think you get way more bleed, um, when you have the amp, like kind of 
facing the you know towards the microphones and stuff like that so what i've been doing recently is trying to almost set it up like uh, you know like you would in a live show which a lot of my experience comes from that too i was a uh before i was full time at the studio i was um a front of house engineer and uh you know working at a small venue in knoxville um and so I got a lot of experience with like, you know, uh, everything that I learned about like EQs and compression compressors and stuff like that was because I was doing live sound for bands that were touring in and out of Knoxville or, or were from around Knoxville and coming to this venue. And so like a lot of those live shows, you know, the drums are kind of, you know, uh, at the, at the back of the stage. Um, and then the drums are, or sorry, the amps are on, you know, the left or the right of the, uh, of the of the drum set and mm -hmm. so i started doing that in the studio and just found that even though the amps were were kind of loud i wasn't really getting that much amp bleed into like the overhead mics for example um so i just kept doing that and that's seemed to work pretty well for me one of, one of my other tricks though is like if it's a video where like it just kind of depends on the band if you've got a if you've got a band that has like huge half stacks and they're like this big rock band for some, you know, for whatever reason, it might look cool, or maybe the band thinks that it looks cool. You know, whatever, it doesn't matter. You you kind of want those amps in the shot. But if it's like a more like indie rock kind of a thing, and it's not important to have the amps in the sh in in the shot, then I'll use those little um, radial SGI boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I've got a um, I've got kind of a, uh, like an isolation room. Uh, that's a part of the hallway that I sectioned off and, you know, you can set guitar amps out in there and just run a long cable to them. Um, what's, what's the radial SGI box? The SGI is, uh, it's, it stands for studio guitar interface. And what it lets you do is you can, um, come like out of your guitar or out of your pedal board, um, at instrument level and then send a signal, uh, I think up to, 150 feet over an XLR cable and it's got like probably like a little preamplifier in there or something to help the to keep from basically having signal loss of long cable runs that you would have with like uh, a really long guitar cable and, and you know if you've never done that before if you've never run like a 30 foot instrument cable and listened to your guitar amp versus a 10 foot instrument cable you'll notice that there's some high end that that you're right. losing so what the what the radial does is it lets you um, make these long cable runs over XLR and it's an active box that basically keeps the signal, um, keeps from having signal loss over these long cable runs. And then you can put the guitar amp anywhere that you want to, to keep from like, if you're trying to minimize bleed or whatever, which is, you know, if, for me is almost only if it's like a more like acoustic indie rock kind of a band and like the guys playing like a little Fender Princeton or something like that. But it's like, mostly acoustic guitar or like an acoustic guitar and a cello I've had. And, you know, then you've got this one electric guitar amp where the guy's like playing some pads, but you don't want it to bleed all over these, all these condenser mics that you have mm -hmm. in the room. You can, you can separate the, separate the amp. The other, the, the third and final trick that I have too for, for isolating is, um, I've just done the whole, uh, you know, take a DI while I'm tracking the live thing and it doesn't sound good, but you just turn the amp down as low as you can possibly get it. Um, it doesn't sound good in the room at all, and it doesn't even really sound that great uh, going to tape. But then as soon as the session's over, um, just taking using a reamping box to come out of Pro Tools and go back into the guitar amp and then cranking it up and just re-recording re it after the, after the live session. And so then you can get the really loud, you know, the pushed, you know, 100-watt Marshall sound without it, like, destroying your drum tracks. Interesting. All right, so... Just to clarify that the um, the DI your guitar goes into the DI box and then um, continues on to the amp, but you capture the direct guitar signal, so it sounds like super plain in the recording. Would but but then you can use that direct guitar sound to reamp it, so you don't reamp the amp sound, you reamp the DI sound. Yeah, I'm reamping the reamping the DI sound, and I'll actually capture the guitar amp so that the so that the guy that's playing is hearing the guitar, you know, sound kind of like what he's used to hearing it, but it's like at the lowest possible volume yeah, that you can yeah. get it, which on a 100-watt guitar amp usually doesn't sound very good. Right. Well, unless you can get one of those power soak boxes, those sure. things are pretty fascinating where you you plug the amp head into the power soak box on its way to the speaker, then the amp can be cranked, but the speaker's super quiet. 
mm-hmm. that can help a little bit. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, all right, well, let's talk about uh, how you like to set up your drums. We always like to talk about drums. Oh, that's my, that is my, my favorite part of making any record, like the drum, drum session and the whole thing too. Like not just, excuse me, not just setting up the microphones and, and get the sounds, but like even the even the editing, like I love, I love beat detective. I love making drums like edited and still sound Mm -hmm. like the player, but not, you know, so, um, yeah, drum recording. Um, and it's super exciting here because of this large room, um, that we have. So let me, before I talk about what I do with the microphones, let me describe the room a little bit more for the rock stars. That's cool. So, um, it's an old church, uh, but we pulled up the carpet. And so below the carpet is just, uh, a concrete floor. And uh, we painted it so that it's got kind of a finish to it or whatever. But then we just have rugs under all of our instruments. Um, and then we have a couple of extra rugs that are just rolled up so that if, you know, like a guitar player wants to go out there and stand or when we've done different live sessions and stuff like that, we can pull these rugs out and give somebody something to stand on that's not just cold concrete. Um, and then the ceilings are uh, 24 foot high and it's it's a peaked ceiling. Just, you know, imagine any church. It's like the standard church roof with these big um, wooden trusses in it. Um, and so it's like a long, a long rectangle, 30 feet by, by 50 feet. And then, uh, right next to, um, right next to the control room is kind of the main entrance to the studio, but it's also like, it's the hallway that goes to, we have a bunk room here and then, um, we have a a kitchen and then we also right down by the kitchen, we have a, a B room. That's like a edit or, you know, mix or vocal tuning kind of a suite. What's a bunk room? Oh, the bunk room is we have um, a room that just has four bunk beds in it. So when out of town bands come, they have a place to stay. Oh, that's very hip, man. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. So we got four bunk beds and uh, a bathroom and a full kitchen. And um, but when you're tracking, you know, drums, like I always want to use as much of the space as I can. And so when you go out of the live room, there's a big there's a big door that goes from the live room into the hallway. And then it's about 12 feet to the next door and wall that separates the bunk room and the kitchen and, um, everything else from, from the tracking room and the, the, uh, the live room and the control room. Um, and so what I'll do when I'm tracking drums is, you know, your standard, your standard fare on the drum kit, a uh, couple of mics on the kick, a couple of mics on the snare, a Tom mic, overhead mics, um, you know, and that, that changes depending on the session and probably the mood that I'm in that day, but there's kind of some standbys. I like to have a, a beta 57 on the top of the snare. Um, uh, my partner, Matt has a vintage AKG D 12. That's always the inside kick drum mic for me. Almost Mm -hmm. always. It just sounds awesome. Um, but then where I start to play around with it is, um, room microphones because we have such a big room and there's just different, there's always places that you could put stuff that you've never tried before. Mm -hmm. Um, so right now, like we have these big, um, we have these big gobos that we made that are eight foot by four foot tall and they've got four inches of rock soul in them on the front side and then a layer of, uh, two layers of drywall and then, um, uh, a solid layer of five eighths plywood 
on the backside. So they're super thick, they're hard on one side, and they're soft on the other. And we'll, we have three of them, they're on wheels, and so we'll surround the drum kit with those. I'll put one right behind the drums, and two on the sides of the drums. Uh, and, and the goal for me is to try to keep the overheads from sounding too roomy. Um, but then those gobos present a great place to be able to put different room microphones up. And so right now my, my favorite trick is to have, a, we've got a pair of the Bayer dynamic, are they one sixties, the little ribbon mics that, yeah, the M one sixties. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a pair of those on like a stereo bar and, um, I'll put them in like a wide, like that. I don't know if it's ORTF or what it is, but it's just that, you know, they're pointing like they're pointing outward instead of inward. Um, and I'll put those like maybe six inches away from the hard side of the gobo that's behind the drum kit. So basically if you're picturing it, you've got like the drummer's throne and then two feet behind the drummer's throne is this gobo. And that's the soft side, the, the, you know, the absorbent side, and then it's eight inches deep. And then the backside is solid plywood. And then six inches behind that, is the 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 pair of 160s um and it just it's which way do they point do they point toward the drums or away from the drums yeah they're, they're the pointing towards they're pointing towards the drums they're pointing basically right at the back side of that of that gobo which is there's probably um the most recent couple of times that i've tried it there's uh, probably maybe two feet between the backside of the gobo and the wall that sits behind the drum kit so it's 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 cool because it doesn't get too simply because they're they're ribbon microphones, so they're not like you know there's not like these piercing slappy high end sounds from the cymbals. Mm -hmm. um, but it also you don't get a ton of uh, a ton of transient from the drums either. It's just like it's a really even kind of stereo room sound um, that gives you you know nice ambience without too much transient or too much cymbal which yeah. is usually what I'm going for in drums is I'm always trying to figure out like, how can I make this snare drum sound longer without having to use a reverb? Yep, totally. Well, that's good. Cause that was going to be my, one of my questions for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and another uh, thought that I want to inject is talking about room mics on drums. I've tried a lot of different things in my studio and, and my room mics um, tend to live up in the loft, sort of looking down over the loft towards the drums below and yeah. I've tried spacing out pairs and I've tried, um, you know, a pair that's sort of like, you know, arm's length away from each other. And then more recently, I've been putting them together, kind of like you described, almost like stereo. Well, actually, yeah, on a stereo bar. And one of the nice things about using a stereo bar is, uh, or maybe I should say one of the challenges about spaced pairs is the mics tend not to sound the same unless you have a very symmetrical space. So I would end up listening to my my spaced room mics and, and I'd listen to one. I'm like, that one sounds like the kick's loud. And then I listen to the other and it's like, that one sounds like the snare's loud. And when you try and pan them out from each other, um, unless you dig that kind of imbalanced perspective on it, which could be a cool effect, um, whenever you wish that your drum sounded more just balanced, it can be frustrating. And, and just bringing the mics closer together seemed to solve that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, no, I, I, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I noticed also that you had for your overheads, the, uh, looked like the Octava MK 12s or something like that in some of your videos. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I've used those a ton. They're actually, um, for, for live video, I, I like that and doing that kind of X, Y or O R T F, whatever it is kind of pattern more than, um, more than doing a space pair when I'm doing like a big rock record or even like a country thing and the drums are by themselves. I like, I like the spaced pair more and I'll, I kind of switch it up between, uh, AKG four fourteens or, um, I'll use a pair of ribbon mics like the, uh, the voodoo. We have the black voodoo VR one. I mm -hmm. think SC electronics makes those. And those are really cool sounding, especially, um, if the drummer has bright symbols using a ribbon mic is like, my go-to for, for, for overheads. Um, yeah. um, and those are mics sound pretty good on, on overheads, I think. Um, but the, but the octavas that you're asking about, I think for live stuff, um, those don't sound, the drum kit doesn't sound quite as, as spread out. Um, and, uh, I just also really like the way that for some reason to me, the small, the, the small diaphragms, um, 
when you're when you're tracking live like it seems like i i get a better picture of like a better stereo image of what's going on in the drums but then also like i'm not getting like as much weird bleed from guitar amps or the bass amp or whatever as i would from large diaphragm condensers right large large diaphragms i don't know technically why they do this but i always feel like they're just capturing more of everything yeah i do too yeah you know and so if you want more of everything then that's great but if you don't then it gets frustrating Mm -hmm. I think that's why I like them for live is because I'm trying to make it to where it's like I have just enough bleed that it's like cool, but not so much that I'm when I go to mix it that I'm super frustrated about it. So what are some other ways that you lengthen the snare? Um, Do you uh, add reverbs at the mix stage? And then also you mentioned a console, but I didn't get to ask you what it is yet. Okay, um, so let's start with the let's start with the snare question. so kind of the big shift for me too this year has been that a, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now is being tracked through outboard equipment, which is new for me. But in, um, at the beginning of 2018, um, I met uh, a guy, a producer in Atlanta named Matt Goldman, who had been in, uh, in Atlanta for, you know, basically his whole career still lives there actually, but he had had this, uh, studio, uh, called glow in the dark um, that he was actually, that he'd been in for 10 or I, I guess 10 years cause his lease was up and he was looking for a new spot. And so through a long conversation, we ended up figuring out that we would probably be, um, I was actually at his studio to buy gear, but through this long conversation, we ended up figuring out that we would probably be a good fit for each other because I had a huge building and the overhead is very, very low in Jellico, way lower than you could get a building like this for in Nashville or Atlanta or, you know, yeah, any totally. place where, yeah. So, um, but Matt has had a 20 year career, you know, since the late nineties making records and has all this gear that just, you know, that I just don't have, you know, and stuff that has gotten increasingly more expensive over the years. Um, you know, like, uh, we have, a we have a, seventies a, a purple badge U87, which, you know, is not a cheap microphone to buy or like a, a 78 Marshall JMP. That's an awesome sounding guitar amp. And if you are recording real guitars, everyone should have one, but mm-hmm. it's not cheap to buy. And so, um, me having a space and him having a gear, having all the gear plus a console and stuff like that, it just, it just made a lot of sense, um, for us to kind of team up, um, made it cheaper for him to operate his studio business and, uh, it made it better for me because I feel like I can offer my clients way more than what I was doing for them prior to March of 2018. So with that has come this huge learning curve of trying to figure out like, how do I go from being this guy that really had like a pretty typical level of like home studio equipment, you know, like a UAD Apollo and stuff that you can get good professional sounds on, but I was mostly a hundred percent in the box um, to now having stuff like this console and distressors and SSL EQ and a 500 series rack and, you know, 1176s and things like that, um, has been super fun, but every recording has, uh, turned into a little bit of an experiment, which is also really fun, but can also be a, a little distracting at times, I think. Right. But, Cause now you have to try, you have to learn all these new tools too. Yeah, yeah, but one of the one of the things that's been awesome for me about that is that um, it's it's kind of changed the way that I think about recording. When you don't have a lot of gear and you're just kind of recording these sounds, it's just you're putting up a microphone in front of your source, and you know it's it's not EQ'd, it's not compressed, or you know whatever. You're you're coming up with something that um, can sound a little bit bland, you know. And the question that I would get a lot of times for the first three years that I was doing this is like. But it's not going to sound that way when you mix it, right? And I got so tired of that question of having a band <laughs> sit on my couch and be like, "But what's it going to sound?" You know. And so, but that's that was that was great, like you know, a, a great push for me to try to figure out like how can I stop that question from having, um, and not the outboard gear is necessarily the answer. There are other things that you could do, and certainly you can use you know plugins if you're on like the UAD platform or there's probably other people out there. Antelope I think has some plugins built into their stuff or whatever. But um, the point when is, you, is when that, you're saying plugins, you mean you mean uh, systems that allow you to use the plugins while you're tracking so that you can hear yes. that mix sound more more readily. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, 
or I think there are other things out there that like, I mean, I'm sure there's probably not a ton of home studio guys that are invested into this kind of thing, but like, you know, with Pro Tools HD, um, you can, there, there are, uh, what are they called? There are they yeah, HDX TDM plugins? plugins T- yeah. yeah. There are plugins that you can use while you're tracking, you know, kind of like you would use with, you know, outboard gear where you can put it on and you can go ahead and shape it and you're not going to add latency or crazy, you know, you're not going to have problems with that while you're, while you're recording the song. But for me, it just became this thing of like, I, I want to put up, um, I want to put up room mics. I want to try to figure out how to make the drum sound better. I want my kick to be EQ'd on the way in, you know, so that it sounds like a kick drum on a rock record. I want my snare to be compressed so that I can stop getting this, this question of like, it's going to sound better. Right. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to do and it's a pretty steep learning curve. And it's also one of those things that for me was like, I don't know. I come from this world where you just, you know, you turn up a mic pre and you get the gain staging, right. And then that's, that's the way that it is to now trying to, learn how to like commit to a sound from the very, very beginning. But it's also like, it's this thing. What happens is, is you end up, you end up, the song is like almost mixed by the time that you finish tracking it. And so what happened for me is I was going from, you know, sometimes two to two and a half days just to, to mix a song, you know, all tracking is done, all editing is done. And I'm taking, I'm spending, you know, two, eight hour days to mix one song. And it was so frustrating. And I was like, how am I ever going to make any money at this to now? It's like, um, you just listen differently when you think you're committing to the sounds, I think, and you are, you're compressing, but you're like listening to what it's doing, like a little more intently than you probably are with plugins. It feels a little more tactile to me to turn a knob and to instantly Mm -hmm. hear. It just feels different for me. I know it's probably not that different than using a plugin, but it is different. I think to turn a knob and to get that instantaneous feedback of your hands and your ears being a separate thing from the computer and helps you to kind of get this, to be a little bit more creative with it. It's kind of the same thing as if you're a guitar player standing in front of your amp with a pedal board and trying to come up with, you know, this sound that maybe you've heard on a record or you're hearing in your head with like a delay pedal or a phaser or something like that. You're it's, it's kind of the same, same way for me, I think with, with outboard gear and then, you know, you don't always get it right, but you, you end up, um, a lot of times like my kick drum just sounds right by the time that, you know, the drums are done and I don't ever have the drummer asking me or bugging me about like, can you make my kick have like more, like it doesn't sound mean enough or, you know, whatever it is. Um, the band is just happy and the drums sound super cool. So I'm doing, even if even if I might not get it right, I might mess something up. I'm trying to process as many of the sources as I can to what I think they should sound like before I mix it. So that when I come to mixing, it's like done. Well, I, I would point out that um, I bet you had to go through the process of first learning how to just gain stage mics and do ma- mic placement and record a band without doing that stuff. Then learn how to make some mic- mix moves on that stuff to understand what would need to happen next to get it to sound like a record, then take those mix moves and kind of go backwards and start committing to that stuff in advance. For sure. And I think, you know, something like the slate, uh, bundle where you get all the plugins for like, you know, whatever, I think it's $15 a month. Um, when that, when that first came out, I can remember uh, that's when I was really starting to um, I wasn't quite full time yet, but I was mixing more stuff. I was doing more projects and I remember having all these plugins, but I just said to myself, I'm going to learn how to do this one batch right here. I'm going to learn what this red compressor does, what this SSL EQ does, you know, all, all the stuff that was in there, what an 1176 does. And then as they added plugins, you know, just learning a little bit of that stuff every step of the way, um, and just focused on you know, I have entire mixes that were just done with virtual mix rack. And so I think once real gear got here, real outboard gear, um, I think that made that transition a little bit easier for me because I already knew like, well, when I'm putting this plug in on a mix, that's an 1176 plug in, this is what I'm doing. And so, and you know, and like you're saying, I already knew the gain structure. And so popping the you know, the, we don't have an actual real 1176. We have the purple, the MC 77s, Mm -hmm. just, which is basically an 1176. And so using that on a vocal during tracking, wasn't nearly as scary because I already had kind of a, an expected result that I was trying to achieve. 
Yeah, I think one of the things you learn about compression at first is when it's wrong. <laughs> you, know, you just <laughs> yeah. you you have to try stuff and and overcook it and you know hit it with the wrong kind of low end on the way in and stuff like that to really begin to understand when it's not really doing what you want it to do. Yeah. Um, but compressors are just super fun. I mean, everybody should just treat them like guitar pedals. Just crank them and see what sounds cool and fun, you know, and then. And then yeah. find out what, what sounds you just hate later where you're like, man, I really screwed that up. Well, that's the best way to try to, to kind of identify like what, to, what doing something wrong with a compressor is going to sound like, you know, like push it to its limits just like you would with a, you know, I remember being 17 years old and getting my first Dynacomp and hating it because I was like, I don't know how to make this thing do what it's supposed to do and not really understanding, you know, this little tiny two knob compressor and how to make it work for my electric guitar, but yeah. I think it's kind of the same thing with, you know, you get a distressor that has a bunch of knobs and switches and buttons on it. Just, you know, take some time one day. And this is actually what I did. This is probably a good tip for anybody that's thinking about getting into using outboard gear is when I, when the, when Matt and I first moved his gear up here from Atlanta and, and wired it into the studio, I was actually still the first couple of projects with everything in the room was still recording it uh, through the console, but just the same way that I was doing it with my Apollo, just a preamp and no processing. And then, you know, coming back and doing it later. But what I did, and, and this was actually some great recording advice that Matt gave me is he was like, well, just do, he's like, just when you go to process it, uh, just wait until you've done the tracking and then patch it in on the patch bay. So you can play around with it and see what it feels like. And so that's what I would do is I would just like, you know, the first time that I wanted to use like the fatso on my drum overheads, just running the drum overheads out of Pro Tools and into the fatso and then back into Pro Tools through the patch bay and then just playing around with the knobs and trying to figure out what do I like that this fatso does to my drum overheads versus not tracking with that mm -hmm. on my overheads. And then that kind of gave me, uh, um, what am I trying to say, kind of gave me a perspective of what I should be listening for when I'm doing this for real with a band the next time. Yeah, that's smart. And then hopefully, you know, you had a good, uh, or you remembered sort of where you set that mic pre um, when you rec captured it in the first place and then, you know, before it hits the fat. So, so you have a, you, again, gain structure. So you sort of know what that gain structure was supposed to be. That's one of the challenges. I think when I first used all the outboard gear is you patch a few things together and then you find yourself quickly lost because you, you kind of don't know if things are going too quiet from one piece of gear to the other or way too loud and, and it, you have to, you know, struggle around with that until you finally get there. But, um, there was something you said about, you know, inviting Matt to come up and do your studio and, um, you know, make gem city, uh, a really high end pro studio. And, uh, you know, my question is what are some things that you want to say about, um, you know, even even for Matt to come from another city to the studio with you, what are what are things that you guys have discovered about finding artists, finding bands, bringing them into the studio, making it work as a business so that you really can uh, grow this thing? You know, and maybe you're still going through that process, but share some stories with us about um, successes and failures in terms of like, you know, the going full time with the studio aspect. Yeah, so I think... Um for me, probably the biggest thing that's been a little bit of a struggle of just trying to figure out um, is how to how to share the space with somebody that you know for uh, that, that's had a had a twenty year career and made some made some really cool uh, some really cool sounding records and has a really long list of of clients um, that have come to him and continue to come back to him over the years or people that you know Matt made all the the under oath records in the middle 2000s so there's tons of like these hardcore bands that sound like under oath that are still today like big fans of those records that want him to make their to make their record and so for him like nice. moving the studio wasn't really a big thing because um wherever he was at they were just going to come to him anyways because that because he's you know a producer that has you know, I guess some, some status or some credibility, you know, has built up a reputation for himself. And so what does it look like is the question that I've had to ask myself and that he and I've had to talk about, like for me, somebody who's really just like, you know, this is only the beginning of my second year, uh, or no, be, be, yeah, beginning of my second year being full time in, um, 
in recording as a, you know, my full-time job. And, uh, so what does it look like for us to partner up and share the space and like, you know, what's, you know, the right amount of time for him to, you know, since a lot of the gear is his, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure he feels at times like I need to have access to this when I need to have access to it, you know, but at the same time, like if I have somebody scheduled, what's it look like to work around each other and to have, you know, a session, me have a session going on in the daytime and him having a session maybe going on in the nighttime and just, mm-hmm. just trying to figure that out. And I think, uh, Matt and I are both very shoot from the hip kind of guys and in the moment. And so the most that we've done with organization, as far as that, that goes is we have a shared calendar and, um, we mostly treat it first come first serve. So if I've got a client that wants a date, as soon as that date's confirmed and I have a deposit, it goes on the calendar. But there's been a few instances where like, um, you know, something will come up and he, you know, really has somebody that, you know, they're getting ready to go on a tour and they want to get a weekend before or whatever. And so the question comes up like, you know, can we shift some things around, you know, is that possible or, 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 or whatever. And so I think it's just being, for us, it's just being courteous and, and have, making sure that we have good communication, you know, yeah. because we're not really business partners in the sense of like everybody that comes through the doors of the studio is like a shared client or anything like that. If he needs a hand with something, I've tracked guitars for him on his clients and, you know, uh, and he's, he's played drums for me on records for my clients because he's a, Matt Goldman's a fantastic drummer too. Um, and we just kind of, you know, we try to approach it that way where it's like pretty organic and we're, you know, like, uh, this is, I think this might be a negative way to say it, but I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Where we're just trying to help each other out and, and kind of live alongside of each other in this, uh, in this cool facility that we have together. Well, it sounds like you also created a studio environment where, you know, the the downward pressure of of um, the overhead of the space and the monthly bills and everything is not overwhelming. Maybe so, it gives you a little bit more freedom and liberty to um, to really grow this thing and and adapt and kind of go with the flow. Yeah, for sure. That's always been on my side, um, and. And probably is one of the things that caused me to try to get into this maybe a little bit earlier than I should have. Like maybe I quit my, you know, I just, you just wonder these things. Like maybe I quit my full-time job a little too early. Um, but at the same time, having the low overhead is what makes this really viable for both of us in a town like Jellico because it gives you the freedom to be maybe a little bit more choosy with projects than you would have to be if I was in a bigger place like you know, Nashville or Atlanta. And this, you know, this, this space would cost, you know, several thousand dollars a month. If it was in a big city, it'd be under high demand, you know, and they would want to have a really long lease and stuff like that. I've not ever had to worry about any of that. Yeah. So it lets you focus on just making sure that the, um, the studio gear and the instruments are where all the priority goes, which is great. Yeah. Um, Oh, what was I going to say about that? I forgot. I had a question lined up, (laughs) but, um, how about guitars? You want to talk about, um, you know, rec- your, some of your favorite ways to record guitars? I mean, I know guitars and, and rock bands are real important to you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm pretty simple. Uh, I don't, I don't have a ton of crazy. Like, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not big on blending multiple microphones together. Um, occasionally, I'll do it uh, if I'm just like searching for a sound. But the big thing for me is not really in uh, blending multiple microphones together or like. Um, I was listening to, uh, I think I was watching a YouTube video, um, where they were talking about, uh, I think Warren had, I'm um, forgetting the guy's name is one of Warren's videos. And he had, uh, the guy that did the Alice in Chains did dirt. Um, what is mm-hmm. that guy's name? Anyways, it doesn't matter. He was talking about having like multiple, like six, six guitar amps and cabinets and blending all these sounds together to create this massive, like rock guitar sound. Um, Which is fun to do. I've, I've, I've played with that stuff and it's, it's definitely a fun exploration to try blending as many things together as you can. But sometimes you come back to the simplest way possible, which I'll let you take over from here. (laughs) Yeah. So sometimes you come back to the simplest way possible. But for, for me, I, I think, and, and maybe this is because I was a guitar player in bands and I always had, I was always the guy that if you've gone to the show, there's like, you know, the, that one guy that has like the 46 inch long pedal board that has, you know, every, th- you know, every pedal that you can think of, you know, every kind of effect on it. Um, I wanted to have as many things as possible to try to tweak sounds and to, 
um, to go crazy with it. And so because of that, um, we have a ton of, uh, a ton of pedals here at the studio. Matt has a bunch. Um, uh, he's got 30 or 40. I've got probably 25 or 30. Um, and then there's pedals that people just, I don't know, for some reason people just leave pedals here. So we've got this whole huge shelf of just (laughs) guitar pedals. And so, um, for me, recording guitars is like way more about like trying to get like um, stuff that just sounds interesting because we have this massive collection of diff- different sounding, different sounding guitar pedals, or we've got a bunch of different guitar amplifiers uh, here. I think the one thing that I've learned um, in the last year that I wasn't doing before that has really brought my guitar production game way up is doing like I've always tracked with a DI in case if I needed to reamp something, but a lot of times it was just this useless thing that I just w- hoped that I never had to use, but it was like more like a safety net kind of thing. And mm-hmm. I remember pretty distinctly one of the first projects that Matt brought here that I was sitting in the control room and he was getting a DI and, and tracking with the amp at the same time. But then I was noticing like he was going through and doing like, would do like a small, like maybe just the chorus, you know, just a small section of the song, one part of the song, and would then go through and just make little tiny little, you know, like would try to get a great sounding take, but just make a couple little edits, you know, that are just going to tighten things up just a little bit more. And then as soon as it was edited, would turn the record arm off on the DI and then just right there, uh, just take two seconds to just reamp the chorus guitar. And, and the light bulb went off for me because I was like, Oh, that's genius because not only is he getting all of his guitar editing done while guitar tracking is ha- is happening, but then he's also going ahead and reamping whatever sound that he has set up so that those edits to the DI are already made and re-recorded with the edits. And so you don't ever have to, th- to remember like, oh yeah, I did these edits on the chorus in that one song and I got to go back and reamp that so that the edits are, you know... It's all mm-hmm. done. So you're so when you're done tracking that tune, all the guitars are already edited. You don't have to reamp anything unless if you just want a different sound. Uh, and and it also is you know going back to that conversation of having the guitar player on the couch. You don't you're not going to get that question of like, is it going to sound like that in the final mix? You know that right. which is a which is a terrible question. And also like, um, I think one of the mistakes that I made early on too with like tracking guitars like that is like if there is a little timing mistake and you just leave it um by the end of the day every time you get to that chorus or that bridge or whatever it is with the timing mistake all that anybody in the room is hearing is that one little tiny mistake and it might be like a super small thing that you know is easy to fix after the fact but that's all anybody's hearing and it's super distracting and so it's way way better i think to just go ahead and fix that in in real time, if it's something that's just a simple fix, if it's something that's simple to fix with retracking and you know the guitar player can can do it, then obviously just retrack it. But if it's just like little tightening things, like between your doubles or something like that, man, just do it real quick on the fly, reamp it really fast while the guitar player's tuning up or something, and you'll never, ever get that question, and your guitars will sound awesome and tight. That's a really good tip and reminder that as listeners, ourselves included, everybody tends to highlight the things that are wrong in a track. I mean, we can highlight the things that are right too, like awesome little moments, but we'll get really stuck on tiny things that are wrong and it'll, it'll affect our perception of the whole song or the whole mix when really it's like one little thing that needs to be fixed. Yeah. So it's just good advice to take care of that as soon as you can so it doesn't give people the wrong impression about how, how the song's turning out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I want the band to be as stoked as possible all day yeah. long. You know what there I mean? We haven't said stoked yet on the podcast, so <laughs> well done. Yeah. yeah, thanks. All right, well, hey, we're running to the end here. Um, let's jump into some of the jam session questions and, and kind of roll out real fast. Um any, uh, um, I'll, I'll hit you with this one, uh, favorite hardware tool or something you're excited about now, anything physical in the studio you're, you're thrilled about working with? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, so there's two things. I love this, uh, the ADR vocal stressor. Um, I, I can't remember the number of it, but it, it's like the 73 or something like that. But anyways, um, it's a, it's an EQ and a compressor. So basically a channel strip that I, I guess based on the name was intended for vocals. Um, 
but this has become my favorite EQ that we have for kick drums. Um, what, and I think, um, I think, uh, Matt has told me the reason that he bought it is because it's what Brendan O'Brien used on all of the kick drum sounds for all those stuff, nice. all the things that he was doing in the nineties. But it is, it's like, um, I, I, I think it's better for EQ and a kick drum on the way in than any, uh, I don't know if somebody makes a plugin of this. If they do, I don't have it, but it's like, to me, it's better than any EQ that I've tried for getting a kick drum to sound the way that I think a kick drum should sound um, in a mix. What, and what would you describe about it that seems to sound right to you? So you know the um, the thing that like especially so I use it on my inside mic all the time, um, which I think is right. I don't know, but that's what I like it on. But you know how on an inside mic like um, it kind of sometimes depends on the tuning, but there's almost always this like basketball sound on an inside kick drum mic that just is totally yeah, and it's like. It's the only basketball I'm good at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, me too. Uh, something about that, though, man. It's just, it just this EQ uh, gets rid of that and makes it sound like a man's kick drum easier than anything that I've used so far. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, ladies. Um, awesome, man. Well, that's great, dude. Um, and then, how about a software tool? Anything that you is a favorite or something you're excited about? Uh, man, recently, so I've. Like I said, I've been doing a bunch of country stuff, and I've got this one female vocalist um, that has an incredible voice, um, kind of in the vein of like, uh, like she'd probably be in a similar vein of like an Allison Krauss or something like that. Um, it's like that kind of a like uh, high end kind of a country voice. Um, it's and it's it sounds really good. Uh, I love I love her voice, but there's always for me there's these weird like little tiny like micro frequencies that just bother me um on certain uh like if i'm listening on certain headphones or like when i'm mixing or whatever and soothe that plug-in from oak sound like fixes all of that yeah that's that one's come up a bunch and uh, i still need to try it out i haven't tried it out yet but so lidge note to self check out soothe Rockstars, yeah. note to self, check out Soothe. Yeah, Soothe is Soothe is amazing, and it's it's great for tons of other stuff. But if you're going to use it, be prepared to. Do you have one of the old Macs in your studio, the cheese graters? I I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we we do too. We have a 12 core one, and I Soothe is even with the the buffer set all the way at the top. I I can barely run more than one or two instances of soothe on that computer okay, so it's a processor hog it's right, a well, processor hog <laughs> sometimes you just make a decision on something that you just you know commit that track or bounce it down so that it's you don't you can turn the plug-in back off yep um all right so now how about a um any other tip for the business side of this any online resource or anything like that you want to hit the rock stars to yeah um i mean i think probably a ton of people have mentioned this but i mean you got to keep track of your finances so uh, for me, that's QuickBooks. It's just easy. A lot of the stuff that I do too is not in the studio. I'll travel to go and you know, like uh, installing this Pro Tools and live video rig in a church. And so, you know, keeping track of receipts and making sure that your books are balanced. And uh, you know, Uncle Sam wants his nut, so you got to make sure that he's getting his. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're ready for that because it sucks when you're not. <laughs> nice man. All right, cool. Um, and then let's let's jump to the uh, closing hypothetical question. We're gonna take the way back studio machine, which I don't know how how way back we need to go, but um, let's go back far enough and find um, younger Matt. And you say, "Listen, dude, I want to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could?" Man, I would I, I would go back to 2003, and that's when I so my band had just got out of the studio, and I was uh, our guitar player's brother, um, who is actually a, a, a Nashville guy, uh, John King. Um, he was recording us. Uh, he had a small studio in Paducah, Kentucky, at the time, and the studio process was like so cool for me as somebody that was already like a guitar nerd and into pedals and amps and stuff like that, that I came back and I started like researching a little bit, but as you typically do when you're, you know, a younger, uh, a younger person, you will, uh, only kind of skim the surface level and then immediately jump into getting your hands dirty. And so as a senior in college, I, 
built my first like nice PC um, and then jumped into trying to get uh, whatever software that I could. And so um, somebody hipped me to like a pirated version of Cubase SX3. And I just was trying to, you know, just figure it out and just naughty, do stuff naughty. <laughs> do, I know. I, first of all, I don't recommend that. But second of all, I definitely recommend uh, trying to learn more about it. You know, I, I think I think I probably could have gotten started into this way earlier, but because of the way that I started into it and kind of coming in um, to recording as somebody that was just just trying to just, you know, get down scratchy ideas from my from my guitar into something that I could share with my bandmates, you know, but not having to be in practice. I think I probably could have um, if I would have spent a little bit more time like reading and I don't know what was around in 2003. Was Gear Slits even around then? I have no idea. Um, I think so. Yeah. Okay, but so I, can't I mean, remember. I, but I, I don't remember. But I didn't do any of that kind of stuff. You know, I didn't. I didn't find any books. I just. I literally just. You know, one person. You know, showed me stuff in the studio when my band was in there, and then I just came back and was like, "What interface do I buy? And how do I hook it up to my computer?" And then never tried to learn anything else again, other than school of hard knocks, plugging stuff in, messing a bunch of stuff up, and it was pretty much just a hobby for me from 2003 till 2011 or 12 when my church bought bought that first Pro Tools rig that I started learning on. And so I think if I could go back, I would try to spend more time taking it slow and reading and and learning. And maybe I could have started off a little bit earlier. Yeah. No, I, I love learning stuff about all this. And um, I also love just jumping in and trying things. But every time I learn something and then I, I have like a light bulb go off and I go try it, it's always a positive thing, you know, in the studio. Yeah. Um, Matt, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, man. Totally awesome hanging out with you. Um, I hope I get to see your super cool studio, Gem City, in uh, in Jellico some t- someday and hear some of the records coming out of there. Let the Rockstars know how they can go find out more about you right now and how can they come make their next record with you if they want to. Yeah, so I have a contact form on my website, which is just gemcitystudios.com. Um, so you can get a hold of me that way. That'll go straight to my email. Um, but I'm also like, I'm always down to like talk and answer questions. And so if you want to find me um, on Facebook, you can uh, message me through either the studio's Facebook page um, or you can uh, you can just, you can probably find me pretty easily um, on different, you know, different Facebook groups or just through the, the, the rabbit hole of, of Facebook and coming to the studio's webpage and finding Matt McQueen and just send me a friend request. And, and, uh, you know, if you've got questions about live streaming, would love to answer, you know, how I've set that up or talk. Yeah, it's to cool, man. That. You've done, you've done a lot of cool things with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm down for friends and answering questions because the only way that I know any of the stuff that I know is because I had people that, you know, let me bother uh, bother them over and over again with, you know, questions of how do I do this? How do I do that? What if I do this? Can I try this? You know, those kind of things. So I, I think it's pretty important, you know, in the audio community to give back to folks that have the same kind of questions that I did when I was starting out. And here you are right now doing it, man. So thank you. That's right, man. (laughs) It's awesome. (laughs) Well, dude, uh, again, man, really fun hanging with you. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing you in person. Maybe I'll see you at, at, uh, you know, one of the, the, uh, conference events coming up and, um, rock stars, go check out Gem City Studios. Awesome. Thanks, Lidge. All right, dude. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my first free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.